Alors, c'est un grand honneur pour moi. C'est un grand honneur pour moi, puis pour euh, notre département, pour notre euh, groupe, de, de recevoir aujourd'hui Dr. Kriges Corté. Je vais laisser euh, Yann Charret, qui l'a bien connu, vous allez comprendre pourquoi, euh, le, le présenter de façon euh, plus adéquate un petit peu. Alors, merci, euh, merci d'être venu. Bonjour à tous. Euh, je vais faire la présentation en anglais euh, et puis la, la présentation d'aujourd'hui va être faite euh, en anglais aussi. Um, OK, so it's a great pleasure to, um, to have Nico Kriegescorte uh, speak with us today. Um, so Nico is a professor in psychology and neuroscience at Columbia uh, University. He's the director of cognitive uh, imaging and a principal investigator at Zuckerman Institute. Um, Nico uh, was truly a pioneer of um, fMRI and uh, multivariate analysis, decoding studies um, in fMRI. In fact, he invented a versatile technique called representational similarity analysis for, um, for fMRI. And also I was the first to um, demonstrate the power of representational similarity analysis, which was um, combining um, different imaging modalities um, with the use of representational similarity analysis. Um, he's a little bit more recently also um, pioneered the use of um, artificial intelligence inspired uh, models well, models coming from ai inspired by the brain to try and um, study questions about um, brain function uh, certainly the paper that he's uh, most recognized for is a paper he uh, published in 2014 in the journal pnas um, where he showed that um, brains were individually unique and object representations were individually unique. Um, everybody knows this about him. He's, he's a pioneer for uh, individual differences in brain function. Um, I'm, I'm only kidding. I'm referring to a paper that uh, we published together because Nico was my um, postdoc advisor um, in Cambridge um, for the best of five years, uh, if I remember uh, correctly. Um, we've had great times in Cambridge. Nico is a very kind and a devoted person. So um, I'm really happy to have him speak um, today. So um, without any uh, further ado, um, thank you, Nico, for coming to talk to us again. And I give you the mic. Thanks so much, Jan. It's great to be in Montreal, virtually. So I think screen sharing needs to be enabled. So I can't, oh yeah, no, it's working, yeah. Is that working? Can you see my screen share? Oh, it's switching a little bit. Let's see if it calms down. Can you see my my screen share? I think there's an issue with my Zoom. I should Good call back in. Can you hear me and see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. All right, let's get started. So my, my title today is Controversial Stimuli, Optimizing Experiments to Adjudicate Among Computational Hypotheses. 
So this is mainly about vision. So our lab uh, studies vision, but there's also going to be an application to the domain of language of this uh, new approach that we've been working on, which we call controversial stimuli. And I want to uh, share a little bit about this, um, th this concept. This is joint work with a really brilliant postdoc in the lab who's also on the job market, and that's Tal Golan. And there's a number of other contributors in the lab to this. So what do we mean by controversial stimuli? What is this all about? Well, as scientists, we always want to design experiments to adjudicate among competing theories. We do empirical research because we're interested and drawing theoretical conclusions. So at the outset of designing an experiment, we have some, something on our minds in terms of uh, different theoretical possibilities that we're interested in. And then we design experiments whose outcomes will enable us to decide between these, these theoretical possibilities. We work in perceptual neuroscience, and in perceptual neuroscience, of course, a key decision of experimental design is the choice of the stimuli. So we choose stimuli that will help us adjudicate among the theories that we want to adjudicate between. And increasingly, our theories are implemented in computational models. And when that's the case, when our hypotheses are implemented in complex brain computational models, then we need optimization techniques to make stimuli that elicit distinct predictions from different models. So um, you know, there, there's this more abstract level of the theory, and then there's the more concrete level of models that implement theories, and we need these to uh, to test the theories. We need these explicit computational models on the one hand uh, to determine if some theory about cognition can actually account for the information processing, if it can explain how a system might process the information and produce task behavior. But we also need these models in order to make concrete predictions about behavior and errors and brain activity and then be able to empirically, formally um, reject models. And in order to do this, um, in order to make theoretical uh, progress, we want to have multiple theories that we're comparing. So we're going to have multiple models. And if our stimuli do not elicit responses from these models that distinguish between these models, where the models make different predictions, then um, the experiment that we're going to do is not going to be useful uh, to make theoretical progress. So this last frame here, uh, this last phrase here, the stimuli that elicit distinct predictions from different models, that's the definition of controversial stimuli, right? So this is perhaps the most important point of the entire talk. What is this concept of controversial stimuli? Um, it's, it's something very simple. It's just stimuli that the models disagree over. So these stimuli are controversial, not um, among people, but they're controversial between at least two models or controversial more generally among some set of models. There's also a slightly um, broader motivation for this, which relates to how we can make theoretical progress with these highly flexible models that we now increasingly use in cognitive computational neuroscience, namely neural network models. Many people are worried about the fact that neural network models often have millions or billions of parameters, and they're trained on very extensive data sets. So many um, people who are used to working with much simpler models with a smaller number of interpretable parameters they rightly warn against these highly flexible models because um, they feel that these, these models are just an exercise in data fitting and cannot really uh, support 
theoretical progress. And so a secondary goal um, of mine today is to convince you that uh, first we need these uh, highly flexible models and second, that we can make theoretical progress using these models. So the way that I think about this is that neural network models provide a language for expressing hypotheses about brain computation. So they're a very flexible framework in which we can express hypotheses about how the brain processes information. And that's extremely uh, important because it enables us to formulate the, these more specific hypotheses about information processing in the brain that can actually be tested. And these models' high parametric complexity is both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because it enables us to capture intelligent behavior. And the history of AI has shown that in order to make, uh, to engineer an intelligent artifact, we need to give the model the capacity uh, to absorb large quantities of world knowledge. So if you remember the early history of AI, there were ideas on very general algorithms for intelligence, and those algorithms are very important and, uh, and amazing, but they don't scale well when it comes to real world um, complexity. And real world uh, feats of intelligence uh, rely a lot on knowledge. And this gave rise to this uh, shift in AI research first to expert systems and then to statistical systems and also spawned the rise of machine learning as central to AI, where it's all about absorbing a lot of knowledge from the environment. When we think of vision in particular, um, the way that this plays out is that in order to do vision, you have to know what stuff looks like. And that is not going to be compressible into a very small number of interpretable parameters. So we need, in order to understand how vision works, um, or uh, for that matter, how higher level cognitive processes or something like language perception works, we need to have models that have high capacity. So that's the blessing that uh, neural networks enable us to give our models this high capacity to absorb knowledge from the world. However, the hyperometric complexity is also a curse because it makes it hard to adjudicate between different models. So on the one hand, we need these, these high capacity models, but on the other hand, we're worried about the, the flexibility. So I'm gonna start with um, two examples from the lab where, um, we did projects that did not use controversial stimuli, and they were um, important projects from the lab, and we learned something from them, but we also sort of bumped up uh, against this, this issue, against the, the limits of what you can do um, without using um, uh, especially designed stimuli to adjudicate among different uh, models. So the first example is about explaining human face dissimilarity judgments. And here what we did was we generated lots of face images using the Basel face space um, graphics model. And we had a particular um, strategy for sampling pairs of faces where we had a number of um, different angles in face space from the average face and a number of different uh, radii that uh, define the eccentricity, the distance in phase space from the average phase. And this defined a set of geometries for pairs of faces. And we generated a large number of these face pairs. And then we had subjects uh, judge the dissimilarity for, for these different face pairs by using a large touch screen where they were shown these different pairs of faces and they could drag and drop these faces by touching the screen and then just moving their finger um, to indicate the dissimilarity um, of this pair of faces. And this was anchored at the top by examples of maximally different faces that are on opposite sides in face space. 
and on the other side by identical faces. So this gave us in a, in a number of subjects, these detailed judgments of how dissimilar these different face images were. And then um, Camila and Catherine and John, the three equal first uh, authors of this uh, project, wanted to see to what extent different computational models could predict these face dissimilarity uh, judgments. And so they had a, a number of really different models. These models included the latent space in the Basel face space model and different aspects of this latent space, like just the shape dimensions or just the shape, uh, just the texture dimensions or the angles in this uh, uh, high dimensional face space and a number of other sets of features, as well as image computable models. So they had some deep neural network models, the VGG architecture trained either on face identification or on object recognition, the LXNet deep neural network, um, some classical computer vision representations, the GIST representation, and some geometrical representations of the uh, relationships between the face features. And when they looked at the extent to which these different models could explain that these face dissimilarity judgments, um, this is the result that they got. And what you see here is that the winning models, which are not significantly different from each other, uh, include some of these deep neural networks, but they also include the Basel face space, latent space, as well as some quite simple lower level representations like the GIST representation. So there are a number of other models here that are significantly worse at explaining these face dissimilarity judgments. So, so that's good. And we learned um, quite a bit from, from this experiment. However, um, there's this issue that um, we have these qualitatively different models here and uh, they all seem to do similarly well at explaining the face dissimilarity judgments. So why can't we distinguish the models? Well, the stimuli are confounded in this case. The models make similar predictions for natural or synthetic faces when the faces are not chosen expressly to discriminate between these models, right? So a good next step would be to design a set of faces uh, for which we know that these models make distinct predictions and then present these faces to to people to judge the dissimilarity. I'm going to give another example, and this is this one involves brain activity data. So Catherine Stores, in her time in the lab, compared diverse deep net architectures and found that they all explain the human inferior temporal representational similarity quite well and similarly well. So I'm going to show you the results here. So she used this, this wide range of different computer vision architectures, including AlexNet and VGG and GoogleNet uh, and a whole range of others. And what I'm going to show you here is the accuracy with which the internal representations in these network models explain the human inferior temporal, temporal representational dissimilarity matrix. So here's the noise ceiling. And for each of the models, there's going to be four bars um, that show the performance of the model um, when different variants of the model are used. So the, the gray variants are when the model is untrained. So the model just is initialized with random weights and has not been trained to recognize uh, images at all. And the blue bars are going to be the case when the model has been trained. And then the dark bars are going to be when the model has been fitted to explain the IT representation. So that is um, reweighting the, the features of the model space so as to explain the brain activity data. And the light bars are going to be when the model is not fitted. So when we do this for AlexNet, we see that both training the model to recognize natural images and fitting the model to best explain 
the IT representation both helps explain variance here. And when we do both of these, we train the model and then we fit the trained model to the IT data, uh, we do relatively best. And when we look at this for all these qualitatively quite different architectures, we get strikingly similar results where um, the, the performance is sort of the, the performance in the end after fitting and training is very similar. And uh, we, it's, it's difficult statistically to, to distinguish these, these different architectures. Note that here, all the models are trained and tested on natural images. So um, this IT representational dissimilarity matrix was for natural object images. And the models are also trained on different sets of, of natural images, the ImageNet data set. So we think that it's the shared features, the deep hierarchy, and the fact that these are convolutional neural network models that explain the relative success of these different models. Why can't we distinguish the different models? Well, each model's parameter space is too expressive. All these the neural network models in general are universal function approximators. And um, each, each of these models has a lot of parameters. And so when they're trained on the same task using the same data set, they come to, uh, to learn very similar um, functions within the realm of natural images. So the models are too expressive for the distinct inductive biases that these models do have to be revealed when we're training and testing on natural images and fitting to the brain activity data. So these two examples provide some motivation for using controversial stimuli. So Tal started with uh, two important insights. First, he noted that training and testing on different sets of natural Im uh, images uh, often does not reveal the differences between models. And uh, this led to his suggestion that we need stronger tests of generalization performance. So somehow we need to um, uh, probe the models, challenge the models to make more difficult uh, predictions. So the first uh, major insight is that to elicit the model's distinct inductive biases, we can test models on a population of stimuli that has not been used in training the models. So these are out of distribution tests. And uh, that's um, where we expect the different inductive biases of the models implicit to different neural net architectures, for example, to really uh, reveal themselves. We could do this with natural stimuli by drawing stimuli from a different uh, population of stimuli, for example, different categories of stimuli that the models have not been trained on. Or we can do this using synthetic stimuli also, where the stimuli are optimized to elicit bolder predictions. And then the second insight is that since our goal is to adjudicate among models, we can create synthetic stimuli that are optimized directly to elicit distinct predictions from different models. So these are stimuli that we, we call controversial among the models. So a related approach in the literature that some of you might be familiar with is um, the method of maximally exciting stimuli. Sometimes they're also called super stimuli. So in this, this case, we pick some response inside a neural network model, and then we optimize the stimuli so as to maximize that response. And that could be the response of a single unit, or it could be the average response of a whole layer. And so you get this um, the stimulus that really strongly drives a particular layer or a particular unit. And then these, these stimuli can be presented to uh, people or experimental animals, and we can see what responses they elicit. And if this, this bold prediction that uh, we now have created a super stimulus, um, 
if that super stimulus for the model also turns out to be a super stimulus for the animal, that would lend some support to the model. However, this is distinct from what we're doing here. In controversial stimuli, we're always dealing with at least two models. Um, so the, the concept of controversiality refers to controversiality uh, between two models. The models need to disagree, so there need to be at least two. So we need to define some measure of controversiality of the stimuli, and then we optimize the, uh, the stimulus to be as controversial as possible um, between two models or among a set of models. Tell started working on this um, using the MNIST data set of little handwritten digits. Um, so this was uh, an interesting um, data set to start with because this is a relatively simple computer vision task. It's a, a kind of toy task where the models are rather small. So we can have uh, lots of really qualitatively different models and we can efficiently um, um, optimize the stimuli. So it was kind of a useful starting point. We wanted to test a set of models that are really different and different in theoretically interesting ways. So we wanted to include both feedforward and recurrent models. And we wanted to include both generative and discriminative models, where discriminative models are models that take the image as input and then map to features that are well suited for recognizing the digit. Whereas generative models are models where the model has some kind of statistical model of what each digit looks like. Um, the model, for example, could, could generate images of, of digits and then evaluates the, the likelihood um, for each of the digit classes and does the inference in this more uh, analysis by synthesis kind of fashion. So there were a number of different uh, models in each of these uh, quadrants. And an interesting one here is this short uh, analysis by synthesis uh, model, which we call ABS. So we need to define a controversiality index in order to maximize the controversiality of the stimuli. So in this experiment, uh, this was the controversiality index. So the index is defined for uh, a digit pair and a model pair. So we have models A and B, and we have, for example, digits three and seven. And now um, for a given image, we can determine the controversiality of this image with respect to these two models. So how uh, controversial is this little uh, digit image um, between these two models? Controversiality is defined as the minimum of these four probabilities here, where this first probability is the probability that model A um, detects digit A. So it's the probability that model A assigns to digit A being present in the image X. And this is the probability that um, model A assigns to digit B not being present. And this is uh, model B detecting digit B, but not digit A, right? So the controversiality is, is the minimum of this. So it's uh, maximizing the controversiality pushes up the lower bound of these four, the minimum of these four. So it ensures that all these uh, four probabilities are simultaneously high. So uh, a, a stimulus X with high controversiality is one where model A detects digit A, but not B, and model B detects digit B, but not A. and with, with high confidence, right? So we're looking for these, these images where one model is sure it's a three and it's sure that it's not a seven and the other it's sure that it's a seven and not a three. 
So here's here's the the example where I use one axis to um, plot the contrast between the probabilities that model A assigns to it being a seven versus a three. So on one end of this axis, model A detects a three, but not a seven. And on the other end, uh, model A detects a seven, but not a three. And the vertical axis here shows the same, but for model B. So here um, in this uh, graph, we have these four quadrants. And these two quadrants shown in blue here are the quadrants where the models agree. And these two red quadrants here are the quadrants where the models disagree. So when we look at the natural MNIST digits, they all fall in these corners here. So um, these are natural handwritten digits and the models are all very good. So the models will all categorize them correctly and will categorize them the same way that humans categorize them. And this is a simple way also to understand why um, these natural handwritten digits will not be very powerful for us to distinguish between the models because the models just agree on these digits. And what we do when we make these um, controversial stimuli is we start with some random image and then we iteratively optimize this to maximize this controversiality index. And then we get some, some kind of strange looking um, image that uh, model A thinks with high confidence is a seven, but not a three, and model B uh, classifies it the, the opposite way. So this to me, maybe because I'm German, looks more like a, a seven than a three. So my perception here would agree more with model A than with model B. So in this way, we can pit models against each other. So here's controversial stimuli that are controversial between the models Madri L2 and Capsule Net Recon. And we can look at these particular stimuli and we can look at the label assigned to these with high confidence by these two models. So for example, this looks like a seven to Capsule Net Recon and like a four to Madri L2. And by, just by eyeballing these, we can um, get a feel for whether our perception of the digits is more consistent with one model or the other. So in this case, most of our, our uh, subjects saw columns, tended to see columns of consistent digits here and perceive these digits um, to be consistent with the label assigned by Capsule Net Recon. So in this uh, contest, in the psychophysical experiment that I'm gonna show you the results of in a couple of slides. Uh, in this contest, uh, Capsule Net Recon uh, won. And then pit uh, Capsule Net Recon against another model, um, Gaussian KDE, um, this Gaussian kernel density estimator model. In this case, the Gaussian KDE model um, outperformed the, the Capsule Net Recon model uh, in terms of consistency with the human judgments. And then when we pitted um, the Gaussian KDE model against the shot ABS model, uh, it was the shot analysis by synthesis model that dominated the Gaussian KDE model. So this is sort of an intuitive, um, I, hope, I hope this gives you an intuitive feel for how these especially designed model-driven optimized simuli give us a lot of power to uh, really elicit the differences between these models, despite the fact that all these models are very good at classifying handwritten digits. So Tal generated these controversial stimuli for all pairs of models and all pairs of digits, giving us this really rich set of handwritten digit-like stimuli. Um, and these stimuli formed the basis of a psychophysical experiment. And in that experiment, um, subjects looked at just one stimulus at a time, and then they indicated the probability of presence of each of the digits 
in the stimulus. And these probabilities did not have to add up to one. So you could say, you could indicate that there is both, uh, you know, a three and an eight uh, present, and it doesn't have to, uh, it doesn't have to add up to one. And that was uh, consistent also with how the models were constructed. They all um, had sigmoid outputs and not softmax outputs. So they could also indicate that multiple digits might be present there with, with high probability. This experiment was done uh, online in 30 subjects. And the stimuli included 20 controversial stimuli per model pair for each of the many model pairings. And the stimuli were presented in, in randomized order with um, 820 stimuli um, in these, these 30 subjects. So here's the results from the analysis of the human subject data. So along the horizontal here, you see the human response prediction accuracy. Um, so that's the degree to which the models classifications agree with the human classifications. And here's the noise ceiling, which is based on the consistency between different subjects. And we find that the, all the subjects um, have this gap to the noise ceiling. So this uh, shows us that all the, all the um, different models fall short of fully explaining the explainable variance in these uh, human psychophysical data. But the best performing model is this short analysis by synthesis model. Uh, and this model actually significantly outperforms um, all the other models. When we look at the best performing three models, so they're sort of relatively similar here. And we look back, back at our overall scheme of, of models, we find that these are all models that contain some, some generative mechanism um, of recognition. So that's an interesting sort of lead suggesting that uh, vision in contrast to deep feed forward convolutional neural network models uh, may employ some kind of generative uh, mechanism. However, of course, this is very limited because it's just for this uh, simple set of um, grayscale handwritten digits. So Tal next looked at natural images using um, the CIFAR 10 set of small images. I'm gonna first show you some, some examples here. And these are, um, these are the models along the, the horizontal and the vertical here. And I'm going to show you a matrix where for every combination of models, we see one stimulus that was classified with high con confidence as being a cat by one of the models and as being a horse by the other model. So here's one example where we see a little stimulus, which is classified with high confidence as a horse by the GraphWool joint energy model. And it's classified with high confidence as a cat by the one PCN A6 model. So I see more of a, a horse there. So uh, my perception is more aligned with the graph wool joint energy model. We look at these first uh, three models here. The stimuli that we get are these rubbish images that don't really look like anything to human observers despite the fact that in each of these, for each of these images, one model is uh, essentially certain that it's a cat and the other model is uh, certain that it's a horse. So these are a special case of controversial stimuli, also called adversarial stimuli, where uh, we, we have evidence that both models are uh, different from, from human perception. When we compare these three models to the Angstrom L infinity model, we get these shapes here that arguably look somewhat cat like. So, this is an interesting um, case for a psychophysical experiment with actual subjects. And uh, here in this row, we get stimuli that look somewhat horse like. 
So, so this indicates that the Angstrom L infinity model dominates these first three models, if, if your perception agrees with my interpretation there. There's some evidence that the, the L2 model is a little bit better than the L infinity model. Then when we look at the Gaussian KDE model, which performed quite well on the MNIST data set, it, it totally fails on in this case and gives us these, these uh, classifications that are really inconsistent with human perception. And the best model um, from just this example of just these two categories uh, appears to be the, the graph wool joint energy model, where when, when this model assigns the label of horse, we see um, really like somewhat horse-like or at least zebra-like uh, stimuli here. And similarly for the, the stimuli that the, the model assigns the label cat to. So when um, Tal did the experiment, uh, he found that the best performing model was this graph world joint energy model. And this is actually a hybrid generative and discriminative model. So again, the winning model also for these small natural images was a model that included some, some elements of generative inference. Tal has since been working on scaling this up to, to ImageNet. So this is now larger models with um, uh, larger input images and higher resolution in, input images. So in this case, um, we're limited to models that are differentiable. So we can use uh, analytic gradients to do this, this optimization of the controversial stimuli. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples here. When we pit Inception V3 against ResNet 50, we get these rubbish images providing evidence against both of these models. But then when we pit these two models versus adversarially trained models, we get images that look somewhat, somewhat interesting. So these are classified with high confidence as Weimarana dogs by these adversarially trained uh, models, and they're classified with high confidence as Persian cats by Inception V3 and ResNet 50. And to me, they look uh, a little like Weimarana dogs. So this is somewhat encouraging, perhaps, for these adversarially trained uh, large scale deep neural network models. And here's the converse case where we have. Uh, stimuli that look like Persian cats to these adversarially trained models. They look somewhat um, similar in features maybe to Persian cats. However, when we pit the two adversarially trained models against each other, we get these um, monster looking images that don't really look like anything to us. So we consider these two um, uh, sort of rubbish images that provide evidence against uh, both of these adversarially trained models. So this, I think, shows clearly that these large-scale feed-forward deep neural network um, models do not really match um, human perception. So Tal next took this to the language domain. So uh, I'm going to uh, close by showing you an example uh, from language. So the goal here was to contrast a number of different language models, and these included n-gram models, two-gram models, and three-gram models, which use text corpus frequencies of unique phrases of length n. So they just look at how often do two words uh, appear in sequence, or three words, a triple of words in sequence, how often does that occur in the text corpus, and they translate that into a, a probability assignment for uh, each possible sentence. So each of these models assigns a probability to each sentence, and that's the property that we wanted to test here. Tal and, and Matt and Chris also included uh, classical neural network models. Um, RNN recurrent neural network models and long short-term memory recurrent neural network models. 
And these are recurrent neural nets that use uh, fixed token embeddings. And they also included um, these, this newer generation of transformer neural networks, including um, BERT and GPD-2 and a number of others. And these are neural nets that use context-dependent embeddings and multiple attention heads. So to give an intuition of um, what we tried to do here, um, I'm going to show you a kind of cartoon diagram of sentence space. So sentence space is a discrete space of all possible sentences, but let's imagine it as though it were a continuous space um, of high dimensionality. A given model like BERT assigns a probability to each possible sentence. So it divides the space of sentences into the high probability sentences and the low probability sentences. And it has this, um, this transition region, defines this transition region where every sentence is assigned a probability. And another model such as GPT-2 uh, also assigns a probability to each sentence, but might have a different distribution. So there's regions in sentence space where both models agree that the sentence is likely. And there are other regions where both models agree that a sentence is unlikely. And then also there are controversial parts to sentence space. Um, where the two models disagree, and one of the models thinks that the sentence is likely, and the other model uh, thinks that the, the sentence is unlikely. So the, the, the sentences that humans think are likely tend to fall somewhere here. So the, the intersection where, where all models think that a sentence is likely, that tends to be a, a sentence that humans also find likely. But there are some um, sentences that to humans seem perfectly likely to be encountered in the natural world that some of the models uh, consider unlikely. And that's what um, we would like to test for. So the way that um, Tal and Matt made these controversial uh, sentences is by starting from a natural sentence, N. So this is just a sentence from a text corpus, a natural human-generated human sentence. And then they would consider flipping each of the words in the sentence. They pick a position. So these were eight-word sentences. They pick a position like the, the third word, and then they replace that word with each other word from, from the dictionary and check what the probability is that the model assigns to it. And with this um, discrete algorithm, um, they found a synthetic sentence, S1, such that the probability of the sentence according to GPT-2 was minimized while keeping the probability assigned to the sentence by BERT at least the same. So in this case, um, we would make sure that we stay on this plateau shown in blue here for BERT while minimizing the probability of the sentence according to GPT-2. And uh, they also did the, the converse, where they minimized the probability of the sentence according to BERT, so sliding down this blue distribution here, while staying on the plateau, on the green plateau, uh, corresponding to GPT-2. So here's an example of three such sentences. The sentence uh, written by a, a human that they started with was, this is the lie you have been sold. And the synthetic, the first synthetic sentence, which GPT-2 thought was very unlikely, while Bert thought it was quite likely, was this is the week you have been dying. So this is a perfectly grammatical sentences, but a, a sentence, but a, a bit of an odd sentence because of its meaning. And they also um, made a sentence that 
was likely according to GPT-2, but not BIRD. And that sentence in this case was, that is the narrative we have been sold. So that's actually a perfectly natural sentence. It's not only grammatical, but also makes a lot of sense. And I guess has probably been, been uttered many times by a human. So in this case, most of our human subjects thought that um, between these two synthetic sentences, um, the, the one on the left uh, was much more likely to be encountered. So we presented these kinds of sentences to, to subjects and had the subjects um, choose between two sentences and indicate which of them uh, was more natural. We also got confidence ratings, but they're not used in the analyses that I'm going to present to you. So it's just uh, information about which of uh, two of a pair, pair of sentence uh, appeared more likely to be encountered in the real world. So here's the evaluation and I'm gonna start with random natural sentences. So these are not the synthetic sentences we, we just talked about. When we just take random natural sentences and then evaluate all of these models in terms of how well they predict the human choices when pairs of sentences are uh, evaluated for how likely they are to be encountered, this is the result that we get. Um, we see that uh, all of the models do similarly well. Here's a chance performance at 50% because these are pairs of sentences. Uh, each dot here is a complete replication of the experiment using uh, new subjects and new stimuli. So 10 replications here. So the variability really gives you a sense of the generalizability across both subjects and samples of random sentences. And in gray here is the noise ceiling. So we see that all the models come pretty close to the noise ceiling and there are no significant differences between the models at all. So with natural sentences, this is another example where natural stimuli don't enable us at all to adjudicate between these qualitatively quite different uh, models, including these really simple-minded, just uh, frequency-based probabilistic models and these really big and uh, sophisticated neural network transformer models. We use controversial sentences. We suddenly have a lot of power to adjudicate between models, and we find that a number of the models are significantly below the noise ceiling, and also there are lots of significant differences between models now. In this uh, experiment here, we used uh, controversial sentences, but natural controversial sentences. So these were pairs of natural human generated sentences that were selected for the experiment for their uh, property of being controversial um, for a pair of models. When we use these synthetic controversial um, sentences, then we get even more power to adjudicate um, between the different models. And we get uh, many of these pairwise comparisons uh, significant as well. So when we combine all the data together, um, we get maximum power and we're able to, uh, to reject all the models. So we can find uh, discrepancies of even the best model, with, which is GPT-2 here uh, and the human data. And we also are able to distinguish many of the models inferentially, even though um, GPT-2 and Roberta were not significantly different here. So um, zooming out and getting to the overall conclusions, um, I wanna stress that Despite the importance of controversial stimuli, model independent natural stimuli remain essential for us in, in my lab. And I think they should remain essential more broadly in cognitive computational neuroscience because they provide a general purpose tool for testing models with big data sets. Also, 
in order to design uh, experiments when we use natural stimuli, we do not need to know the models in advance. And this is a, a big advantage, of course. And then also they're ecologically valid. So in my lab, we, we continue to use natural stimuli and we're particularly excited at the moment about um, this massive 70 fMRI data set that um, Thomas Naslaris, Kendrick Kay, and, and Jan Schare uh, collaborated on uh, generating. Uh, and we, we started using this to adjudicate between models and test all our models. And um, that will, I think, um, uh, remain this approach of using natural stimuli to see how different models perform will remain an important, uh, an important pillar of, of our empirical work. However, um, there, are, there is this, this, this trade-off and this long debate between the use of artificial stimuli and natural stimuli um, in the literature, in, in the domain of vision, and also in, in other parts of cognitive computational neuroscience, where artificial stimuli offer us greater control. Um, they're designed to adjudicate between models, and they're often a simple stimuli like the Bohr features and natural stimuli are less controlled, more ecologically valid and often complex stimuli. And I would argue that controversial stimuli offer a kind of synthesis between these two extremes where we can engage these higher level representations in, in vision. We can engage the, the visual knowledge that has been absorbed by complex models, such as uh, neural network models trained on natural tasks. Um, so we get these, these more complex looking stimuli that have many features of natural stimuli, but they're also optimized to uh, adjudicate between different theories and therefore are more powerful in experiments for um, making theoretical progress. So in conclusion, uh, controversial stimuli provide optimized probes for adjudicating among computational hypotheses. They reveal distinct inductive biases of different deep net models. Human vision may rely on a computational mechanism that combines elements of discriminative and generative inference. And this is a, a computational uh, signature of human vision that we're very excited about because it goes beyond the current state of computer vision and really pushes us to think uh, about more interesting algorithms for visual inference. And current language models differ in their ability to recognize high probability English sentences, but none of them can fully account for human judgments of the relative likeliness of sentences. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this uh, thought provoking uh, uh, presentation. Um, questions? Uh, hello, do you hear me? I can. Okay, uh, we have a question for you. I was wondering if you had an example of uh, a uh, controversial uh, stimuli, but for a language. I wonder like what it would look like. Yeah, so I showed you these two um, sentences, right? And these were synthetic controversial um, stimuli. So both of these, this is a controversial stimulus. This is the week you have been dying. And this sentence is controversial between BERT and GPT-2, right? And why is it controversial? Because BERT thinks that this is a high probability sentence and GPT-2 for some reason thinks that this is not a high probability sentence. And you can ask yourself, do you think it's high probability? This is the week you have been dying. It's grammatical, right? But there's something wrong with it. There is no, there is no situation in which someone would be motivated to say that to another person because that person would be 
no longer with us, right? So it's sort of, um, it seems unlikely that you would encounter this, uh, this sentence. Okay, and uh, the S2, so that is the narrative we have been sold, that would also be a controversial stimuli? That's also controversial. Remember, controversial is not controversial between people, right? It's controversial between these two models. So it's not necessarily something that is obviously um, obvious to us why it would be controversial, right? So to us, that is the narrative we have been sold is perfectly natural, right? But the interesting thing is that BERT, this model that is very good at a lot of language tasks and so behaves you know, somewhat similarly, when you just give it a bunch of natural sentences, it will usually think that they're, they're high probability and it will sort of look similar to humans and would look good like the other language models. However, when we probe it with this sentence, it turns out that Bert, for some reason, thinks that that is the narrative we have been sold is not uh, uh, a likely sentence at all, right? So this is a failure mode of Bert. Bert has a, has a hole there, right? It should assign high probability to the sentence. Most of us agree, but Bert, for some reason, hasn't learned this. Okay, therefore, can you know in advance what would be a controversial stimuli? Like for language, because it would be, for me, if that is the narrative we have been sold, I would say, oh yeah, they would all understand it. So how can you know in advance what would be a controversial stimuli for language? Do you have to always test in advance? Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, the key thing is, is not controversial between people, right? Of course, we cannot know that in advance. It's controversial between these two models, right? So we have the two models and we can present any stimuli to the models. And then we can see, is it controversial or not, right? Are the, are the probabilities assigned by the two models very different or are they similar, right? If the model, assign similar probabilities, then whether or not the models agree with people, it could be that both models don't agree with people or both models agree with people, but either way, um, doing a psychophysical experiment where we ask people will not help us distinguish the two models, right? We need something where the two models disagree. And we can know that in advance because the models are computer simulated and we can present the models with huge numbers of sentences and therefore use discrete optimization to, to find these controversial examples. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jean-Maxime had a question. Uh, I don't think I, I raised my hand, but uh, oh, sorry. Um, I will ask a question because I, I had one anyway. Um, <laughs> you just uh, know it, knew it. <laughs> uh, so actually, you you talk about this these convert uh, like these stimuli are between two models or different between two models. Uh, would it would it be possible to adapt it so that it can be like different between two layers in the same models or like? Between, because I think that because you always need the category or the classification at the end, uh, depending on the task that is done by this model to optimize and find the the controversial uh, stimuli. But yeah. do you think? Yes. Absolutely, yeah. So this is also something that that we're doing. So if you wanted to, so two two layers are two different representations, right? So for our purposes, layer three and layer two could be considered two different models. And you can make stimuli that are, in some sense, controversial between um, these different layers. Of course, you have to always define what exactly do you mean by controversiality, right? So here I've shown you behavioral um, uh, experiments using controversial stimuli. And there was relatively straightforward to define what controversiality means. It means that one model classifies the stimulus differently from another model with high confidence, right? Both are very confident and confidently assign different categories. When you have a brain representation, then uh, 
it's more complicated, right? What does it mean for a single stimulus to be differently represented in layer three from layer two? That is ill-defined. So the way that we go about this, maybe unsurprisingly, because we're interested in representational geometries, is we consider a whole uh, set of stimuli, and then we generate stimuli uh, whose representational distance matrices mm -hmm. Uh, uncorrelated, right? And that would give us a lot of power to um, adjudicate between these two layers as alternative models of brain regions. But like does the generated stimuli would be actually uh, very different in the, let's say layer one, and then would be the same uh, in the second layers, or it would be like, depend, no, I don't, sorry. Um, yeah, so you, I mean, it depends exactly, you can define the controversiality in many yes, different exactly. ways, right? So one way is to, to decorrelate the representational distance matrices. And that would mean that, you know, there are some similar stimuli in layer two that are dissimilar in layer one and vice versa, right? Exactly. Both of these would, would happen. And then there are sort of some, some fine points there where, you know, do you want to take into account the noise in the data, do you want to take into account the actual analysis that you're going to do uh, in order to adjudicate between the models? You can uh, uh, fold that into your definition of controversiality so that you optimize your power with whatever uh, model comparative inferential analysis you want to do, right? And this is sort of um, a methodological uh, challenge that we're struggling with at the moment exactly you know how how far to go there but to decorrelate the rdms is already a very useful thing to do yes thank you thanks uh, pierre thank you for the for the wonderful presentation so i with when you build your controversial examples it's almost like you're exposing some well-known flows of those networks with things that look just like nonsensical in a way. And I was just wondering if you thought about uh, building your controversial example in the latent space of something like a big GAN in order to guarantee that they would be kind of like naturalistic looking yeah. and not just kind of like hacks. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so this is uh, a great idea and also something that we're working on. So you can, instead of optimizing the controversial images when you're working in, in vision at the level of pixels, as we did in the work that I just showed you, you can have um, an image generative model, right? And so you would back propagate from the controversiality index through the models to the level of the pixels and then on through your image generative model to the latent space of that model, right? Which could be uh, a GAN or some other image generative model. And then you can optimize the parameters, um, at, optimize the stimuli at the level of the parameters um, of that stimulus generative model. And that's a way of imposing a prior, as you said, for example, reining, the, reining in your stimuli into a space of maybe somewhat more natural stimuli. Uh, and this way you can strike uh, a better balance between controversiality, which gives you a lot of power to reject models and adjudicate between models and ecological validity, where um, you know, maybe you care more about uh, when you can reject one model using stimuli that are still in the domain of, of the natural, right? And there is a very interesting discussion there, you know, if you're very strict about it, you know, if you really had the true model, right, um, then it shouldn't matter uh, how you reject it, right? If your model is true um, and you find that its behavior diverges from uh, the human brain's behavior for something very unnatural, I mean, that does show that it's different, right? That it's not the same mechanism, um, but, of course, we never really have the true model. And many people uh, would argue that we're trying to approximate the function that uh, our perceptual systems 
uh, compute in the realm of natural stimuli only, right? And therefore, um, many of us feel that it's more relevant to use stimuli that are closer to natural stimuli. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, thank you. Uh, really, really cool work. Um, I have a few questions. I don't know if we have uh, time. Maybe I, I can first start with the uh, methodological question uh, concerning um, local minima. So I imagine that when you're optimizing to find an image that's, con that's controversial uh, between a pair of models, there would be multiple ways potentially of finding uh, such image and, and these different images might lead to different uh, human judgments. Uh, so do you think this is the case? And if it's the case, do you think it matters or across stimuli, this will necessarily be uh, equalized uh, or maybe for a given pair of models, it might always get in the same kind of local minimum that will always lead to, to some uh, human judgment. Or... Yeah, that's absolutely true. So, I mean, this is, um... So we shouldn't expect that there is a single controversial stimulus and every time we stop the, the process, we get the same one. We definitely don't, but it's always seeded with a random image and then you get some controversial stimulus, right? And so our, um, our idea is that there is a whole space of controversial stimuli. That's a subspace of all possible stimuli. And the goal is to find a diversity, a kind of sample from that controversial subspace for a pair of models, right? So um, we, we want many of them and we want them to be as diverse as possible. And um, so we, we don't want them to, want the process to always converge to the same solution, right? We want to seed it at, in very different places and we hope for it to converge to very different places. So we get this wide variety of different stimuli, even for the same um, pair of stimuli and pair of, pair of classes and pair of models, right? So for example, let's say we had a three and a seven and we have two models and we think that there are many different uh, controversial stimuli, right? The models disagree. And that means there's a big region of images where they disagree over this classification. And we want to, you know, sample that ideally, right? Mm. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, and also, uh, did you, uh, are you working on the, trying to find controversial stimuli across uh, the whole set of models or is that too computationally uh, hard to do? Uh, and yeah, exactly. just a pair yeah, of models? We're, and... Yeah, we're also doing that, yeah. Um, okay. And um, we've kind of, you know, started thinking about what is better Right, like often we have more than two models and then you could argue, so if you have a dozen models, should you take a pairwise approach or should you make stimuli that sort of give you a lot of power overall to you know, discriminate between all of these models? And then how should you define that? Should it be kind of make sure that there is uh, not a pair of models that you cannot discriminate at all given your entire stimulus set, you know, sort of uh, maximizing the minimum pairwise discriminability. There are many different objectives that you could define to do that. And we, we haven't figured out what the most attractive approach is. So one attractive feature of the pairwise approach is that you can eyeball these stimuli and then you can think of just two models and you can interpret that a little bit, right? Um, and also, if you add another model, then you just have to make all pairwise comparison stimuli for all the other models. But if you make a single set of controversial stimuli for a dozen models, and then you add another model, then you have to start from scratch, right? And all your old data is also not usable anymore, right? So there are many kind of trade-offs there and it's, um, we haven't figured out what the best way is. Okay, thank you. I had another more speculative question, but I, I'll wait uh, until the other questions are asked. Um, thank you. Uh, Jan? You seem muted, Jan. I can't hear you. 
You're not muted, but I can't hear you. No. Okay. So try to figure this out, uh, Jan, and <laughs> I'll uh, give the mic to Pierre again. Okay. So it's more like a conceptual question because you, in the framework you presented, you interpret controversial example are discriminating between models, hypotheses. But it, I would interpret that as rejecting different architecture. Okay, maybe convolutional is better than fully connected, let's say. But really what you're comparing are particular weights that have been learned in those architecture. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking if you were to take the same architecture and train it with different random seeds, mm -hmm. could you identify you know, controversial example, and would that actually be interesting or not? <laughs> okay, curious to hear your thoughts yeah. about that. Um, yeah, that's a great question. That's a really important question that we worry about a lot. So I think there's sort of two levels there, right? One is uh, what, what you alluded to in the beginning, that what is the relationship between the theories and the models? And then for the models, if a model is an architecture, what is the relationship between that architecture and a trained instance of that architecture where you could train the same architecture again from a different random seed or maybe with a different random sample of stimuli, but you still have the same task and you'd get a completely different set of weights, right? And uh, we worry about uh, both of these levels, right? So on the level of the, the instances, um, it's a very interesting question how models differ when they've been, when they have share the same architecture and they've been trained uh, on, from different random seeds or from different random seeds and using different distributions. There's a um, paper by Johannes Mera with um, Tim Kietzmann where we looked at individual differences between deep neural network models and started um, characterizing, you know, how they're, uh, to what extent representations uh, diverge in terms of representational geometries um, when they're trained in this, the same way. Um, but also for the inference um, that we're talking about here, it's uh, an important point that what we really should be doing is uh, for each of our models, we should have a little distribution of sample of different instances, right? That are conceptually the same model because it's the same architecture. And um, then we'd have a distribution, right? And we'd be doing the inference also um, at that level. And that's, that's very important. It's also an important discussion in the context of adversarial stimuli, where you know, it could be true that you have an adversarial stimulus or a controversial stimulus, but that stimulus doesn't generalize to another instance where it's conceptually the same model, it's the same architecture, has the same kinds of non-linearities and gives the same kind of performance, you know, if that controversial or adversarial stimulus then doesn't uh, fool the model anymore, um, you know, then you, uh, you would interpret this very differently, right? You would say, this was just an adversarial stimulus to one instance of the model, right? And so it's not really, uh, justified to reject this architecture class. In fact, it could be true that if we could backpropagate through the human brain, we could make adversarial stimuli in a similar way for, for, for human viewers, right? Or we could make controversial stimuli. We could make a stimulus that looks like, um, like a cat to me and like uh, a horse to, to Jan. Um, and uh, you know, maybe, maybe other people would just see nothing in it. Um, but to us, because of idiosyncrasies of our, our visual systems, um, these stimuli would be very compelling, right? In practice, we cannot do that with humans, um, at least yet, um, because we cannot backpropagate through the human brain and therefore um, we're much less efficient with uh, psychophysical uh, techniques. Um, there might still be a chance through sort of extensive psychophysics to do something like this. And that would be, that would be fascinating, of course. Um, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose it's a, 
a, a question that follows up a little bit, but um, so, you know, you just talk about idiosyncrasies. Um, I suppose one large component about idiosyncrasies is the fact that we all have a different experience of the world, right? Like um, your experience of bratwurst in Germany or some, or, you know, or some food is different from my experience of poutine or, um, you know, good bagels. I mean, you're in New York now, you, you know, have access to good bagels um in a way how much does the uh, training set um, matter right like I, I suppose in the language uh, realm of your studies it doesn't actually apply because gpt2 and bert for example what we see on on the slide now have not necessarily been trained on the same same corpa but in the image world um you know, a lot of the models are trained using ImageNet. Um, and, you know, one of the examples that you've shown was perhaps carefully um, uh, chosen um, uh, to be an example of a dog. Um, and because, you know, we know ImageNet uh, perhaps has too many categories of um, dogs compared to other categories. So uh, how much does the... Um, initial training, uh, the set of, of, of um, the, well, I suppose the space of, um, of features that, that a model is trained with influence the controversial images that are um, resulting. Yeah, I think that is a huge factor. Um, so, you know, if you train a network on different categories, for example, you get a totally different network um, from the adversarial image literature, which is somewhat similar because you're also, I mean, adversarial stimuli are kind of a special case of controversial stimuli where the stimulus is controversial between the model and some definition of ground truth, right? So you, you say that the model differs from ground truth, so the model is fooled by the stimulus. And so it's a special kind of controversial um, stimulus. And there, there's the same issue, you know, to what extent do these stimuli generalize? And what has been found there is that when you have two models that have been trained on, um, that have the same architecture, but trained on different tasks, then they don't generalize very well. And when um, the two models uh, have different architectures even, but the same training set, um, then they, they might generalize to some extent, right? So that's sort of one way of getting a feel for how important uh, the training is. And it seems to be very important. Of course, you would expect um, the training set to, because these models are so flexible to sort of determine the function that the networks compute, especially within the distribution of the training stimuli, right? As you go out of that distribution, and the inductive bias implicit to the architecture has relatively more weight, but um, nevertheless, the, the task, the objective and the stimuli, the distribution of stimuli that the models have been trained with is gonna have a very strong influence. Laurent, did you want to ask another question? Uh, it has pretty much been uh, discussed already in the following questions. It was uh, concerning um, individual uh, idiosyncrasies. Uh, if you think uh, the, the paradigm uh, could be adapted to, uh, to, ad to identify these idiosyncrasies. Um, so do you think, for example, maybe uh, having uh, simultaneously two subjects that perform the experiment and adapting the, the stimuli that are shown to these subjects to find some kind of controversial stimulus or, or something. Uh, controversy between the two subjects? Between the two subjects, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be cool. That would be yeah. um, really interesting. Yeah. And having them do it simultaneously. Um, yeah, because that, that would be easier. Because then you have both sort of online constraints, right? So you can yeah. drive the, yeah. Okay, um, Jean-Maxime, you had another question. 
Yes, uh, my, my question follow uh, Pierre's uh, first question about uh, the use of uh, GAN Latin space uh, to uh, generate more uh, realistic, uh, controversial uh, images. Uh, and you said about, like, you, you talk about rapidly about feeding the, the controversial index to some sort of the, the, the generative model or the generative part of the model. But you said that uh, I just want to get a better understanding of it. But would you, for example, like let the discriminator there and just uh, because how I see it is that you've got two loss function, one for the discriminator that would stay like, is it a, a natural or a fake images and just feed the, the controversial index to the generative loss function. Like the the the, the last yeah one. exactly. So what I was thinking of was you in the GAN while you train the GAN you have the discriminator, um, which provides um, the the signal for training the generator right. Then you you have your trained generator and that sort of absorbed uh, what distribution you want to draw the stimuli from, and you'd use that and interface that with the model you're testing the perceptual model. So now the GAN generator feeds images to the perceptual model and then to each of two perceptual models you compute the, um, the controversiality objective and then back propagate through um, the models and then back through the generators and the discriminators would not be used anymore because you wouldn't update the the generators anymore right the generators just provide a constraint um, for the stimuli you're generating, because now you're making the controversial stimuli in the latent space of the the generator. Yeah, that lost the like all the weightings about the natural images, because my thought is that if you you for example you you retrain the generator only on the controversial index, then it would still be uh, something that may at the end of like multiple epoch uh, be uh, unnatural. But if for example you still like take this discriminator as it as it is and just like add to the generative generator loss function not just the distance between the fake and the generated images but also like the 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 controversial index the for 50 50 of the oh, loss okay function. so you're thinking about training a generator that you can draw controversial images from exactly yeah. Oh, that's also a great idea. So this is actually, um, yeah, that's not what, what we've been exploring so far. So we've just been exploring, like making the controversial stimuli in the latent space of the okay. generator. And then mm -hmm. you do that for every stimulus. And then, you, you know, your stimuli are constrained to the distribution that the generator believes in. So okay. Okay. Um, but that would also be cool. Then you could just draw as many as you want, right? You'd yes. be learning something more general, right? Also related to Laurent's question, do you always you know, get these particular um, replicable controversial stimuli? You know, we discussed, we want the distribution. In this way, you could learn the distribution explicitly, right? So that might be, yes. might be really interesting. Thank you. I have a question here. Uh, all right, uh, I don't know where I'm supposed to be there. Um, very, very interesting. Uh, it looks like there's a lot of stuff we can do with controversial stimuli. I, I see that a lot of people are motivated by that. Um, another thing that we might do actually, um, well, actually you tell me if that's possible. Uh, do you think you could train uh, with one human and one network trying to build that controversial um, uh, stimuli that way. So uh, essentially, on every trial, while well, human would say what is the probability of, let's say, the horse being presented the, the image, and then you would try to find that image that would, uh, like, that the generator uh, or the, the network would uh, would say with high probability is a cat. So that way, you would have directly like this distance of, uh, like, presumably, if you have the perfect network, you would you wouldn't be able to create a controversial stimuli there because you wouldn't have a uh, high probability of, of seeing a cat in a horse image because we don't make that mistake. Uh, does that make any sense? Or like, is there like, is it not tractable? Like, is there too many trial and training? Is it something that- Yeah, I think, I'm, I'm, let me see if I understood you correctly. So you're wondering if we can somehow use um, techniques similar to these in online experiments where we 
do adaptive uh, experimentation and we we make a new stimulus, we present it, then we get the subject's response and that drives sort of updates to the models in real time. Um, yeah, I think that's a very interesting um, idea and it could be it could be done. So you could generate stimuli that uh, you expect the model to fail for in some sense. Um, so these would be stimuli that you're uncertain about and then the response would be very informative to you and you could then um, adjust the model to better um, to better um, capture that part of stimulus space right and that could be an adaptive learning process yeah um, so practically we are looking into these kinds of adaptive approaches but one thing that um, I have learned in this area is that it sometimes isn't key that you uh, make the update after every single stimulus, right? And so it seems attractive to me to do this just across sessions, right? So because otherwise you're, you're very limited computationally when you always have to generate a stimulus immediately and you have almost no data to learn from, and now you're trying to you know, update a very complex model, it seems more attractive to me intuitively and uh, to, to um, get a session of data then update all of the models, adjust all of the models, and then generate a new batch of you know, optimized stimuli. And, and this way, if you go through you know, a dozen sessions or something like that, um, it might still be much more effective than uh, than not having an ad adaptive element to your your experiment. Jan, um, <clears throat> I'm wondering about the choice of uh, using the sort of probability. I guess the output layer of a model to define the, the controversy. Um, you showed you know, stimuli that drive maximal response. Um, I suppose you could also look at, you know, for two models that have a similar architecture or something, um, layer-wise, uh, let's say, you know, we want to know, is the controversy in the early um, low-level properties? Um, then you could look at, I don't know, the average activation difference in the first layer or the second layer of, of the models or something like that. And, and that would be a way to define controversy, but on the basis of their low level physical properties. And then you could, you know, go up in the layers and, and define controversy more on mid-level representations or um, or on high level representations if you even go higher. Have you explored this or is there like a reason why you chose the task objective? Oh, because you, why we did a behavioral experiment rather than- No, I'm, I'm saying your choice of index for the controversy is, you know, mm -hmm. The model predicts with high likelihood that it's um, uh, that A is the letter A and 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 not or that the number is seven but not three. Yeah, um, I mean we wanted to do a behavioral experiment here, right? So we were interested in categorization behavior, and then we wanted controversiality in terms of categorization behavior. But you could do other kinds of judgments, and you could similarly. Uh, define controversiality to mean that there is some other contrast between the two models and how the models respond to the stimuli, and then you'd have tasks to that other thing, right? And similarly, in an fMRI or cell recording experiment, you know, you you might have um, a different a different index of controversiality, right? And you mentioned uh, possibilities like the overall activation. Should you, so, you know, I, I heard the sort of question there, um, what should be the, the criterion, right? Um, so I think you will start with something like you want to, um, you have different computational hypotheses, like two models, and then 
you have a particular kind of measurement like fMRI. And then the question is, what is the optimal experiment to adjudicate between these two models, right? And that depends uh, a lot on what you're measuring, right? So for example, you could argue um, with fMRI, you're very good at measuring the mean activation to each stimulus, um, uh, regional mean activation elicited by each stimulus because every voxel already averages across hundreds of thousands of neurons. And so maybe we should use that as a signature, right? That's what we can measure well. And that would motivate making stimuli controversial with respect to that, right? And Another approach would be to look at the, the representational geometry, right? If you thought that, you know, with the rich set of stimuli, you still get a good signature. Uh, and then you, you would want to um, create stimuli where the two models predict very different representational geometries, right? And it could also, if you had all of this in a model, then you could also quantitatively, um, adjudicate between these two methods, right? Where you're, you're finding kind of um, overall in the responses, you just want them to be as, as um, distinct as possible, right? Yeah. Thank you. Is there any other questions to ask? To uh, Dr. Kriges Corte. You guys are not averse to running over. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I'm afraid we've abused of your generosity a little bit, though. Not, not um, at all. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much again for this uh, great talk. And um, Thanks for having me. We'll see you at VSS, I guess. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.